Hello and a warm welcome to the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement, considered the Nobel Prize for the Environment, and our very first virtual discussion on valuing nature. Whilst we're joining together today to celebrate, the COVID-19 pandemic still rages on around us, an important reminder that we need to find solutions to coexist with nature. Today we'll be discussing valuing nature and unwinding economics' most dismal failure. Now, you might be wondering if there's a story behind that title. Well, for over a hundred years, economics has been considered the dismal science. The idea was that human growth would always outstrip the human food supply and that therefore economics was just the study of human misery. But are we really doomed? Well, our two laureates are here today to discuss the answers. Our two laureates will be joining us remotely for this discussion. Professor Gretchen Daly will be joining us from San Francisco in the United States and Pavan Sukdev will be joining us from Geneva, Switzerland. After a short ceremony to officially recognize our two laureates, we'll delve into our important discussion on valuing nature and unwinding economics most dismal failure. We'd love you to be a part of this conversation, so please add your comments and questions here on YouTube or by tagging us on Twitter at Tyler Prize. But for now, I'll hand over to Julia Maton Lefeuve, Chair of the Executive Committee of the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement, to lead the official ceremony. Julia? Thank you, Jade. Welcome to the celebration of the Distinguished Tyler Prize Laureates for 2020. In view of the pandemic, we decided to postpone the 2020 celebration, which we hope to have in person this year. We are now together on this virtual platform to celebrate and to look forward to a better world, thanks to the contributions of the Tyler Prize laureates. The Tyler Prize Executive Committee is responsible for selecting the laureates and for looking after the generous and visionary endowment for the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement, established in 1973 by John and Alice Tyler, making it one of the earliest prizes in the environment. With today's celebration, 78 individuals and four organizations have been recognized since 1974. You can see why the Tyler Prize is often referred to as the Nobel Prize for the Environment. My fellow members of the Tyler Prize Executive Committee are Rosina Bierbaum, Julia Carabias, Margaret Catley Carlson, Alan Kovic, Ezekiel Escura, Judith McDowell, Ken Nielsen, Jonathan Patz, and Jim Watson. The Tyler Prize is administered by the University of Southern California, represented by Stephen Bradforth, and the prize administrator, Amber Brown. 2020, or the so-called super year for nature and biodiversity, has been postponed to this year, marking the recognition of the life support that healthy ecosystems give us and their key role in our search for solutions to the challenges of climate change, health, food security, and the well-being of our economies. In 2019, the first global assessment on the state of our ecosystems told us that one million species are threatened with extinction, that three quarters of our land and two thirds of marine areas have been seriously damaged by human activities. 2020 marked the end of a UN decade on biodiversity, which unfortunately has not met its goals. And we now recognize the direct link between COVID-19 and other such pandemic diseases and the loss of biodiversity due to human activities. So 2021 is now that super year, giving us the chance to correct the situation and to look forward to a future in which we can consider nature as an important ally in providing solutions to all of our global challenges. We selected our two laureates, Gretchen Daly and Pavan Sukdev, in recognition of their important work in this area. Here is a short video to frame the context of the issue and to reflect on Gretchen's and Pavan's contributions to the proper valuing of nature. In 1973, 
Alice and John Tyler founded the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement. In almost five decades since, 76 individuals and four organizations have been awarded for their contributions to environmental science, policy, and economics. In this extraordinary period of world history, the prize recognizes two individuals working to understand nature's services and our natural capital pioneering a field where economics and conservation collide. In the past, we had a mindset of business versus the environment. Every investment in the environment was seen as coming out of corporate profits. It's not only were we polluting rivers and ecosystems, but we were actually killing them. 50% of the world's wetlands were drained. Uh, the forests were cut down. If we continue to see nature as an infinite provider of services, before we know it, we're going to run out. Tyler Prize decided to recognize Gretchen Daly and Pavan Sukhdev this year because of their very important work in putting a value to natural capital, putting a value to what we have always taken for granted. Clean air, fresh water, pollination of bees to enable plants to grow a climate that we can live in, where we don't have to worry about extreme heat or extreme cold. All these are nature's services. Nature provides them, but doesn't charge for them. Some of the leaders we have today um, don't see the values of nature and see it as just in the way of development. Well, Gretchen's work is really important. Well, she's a critical link, I think, between the environment and the business community especially, because this is something that they haven't really understood and, and embraced. The history of economics had really ignored many fundamental things. So nature has been whittled away and is now down to little scraps around the planet. Gretchen has led the Natural Capital Project, which has a number of important participants. And this has now started a really important movement about valuing nature. Occasionally you get something that comes along and says, whoa, this, this has the power of changing enough thinking that it may actually cause action. People are waking up to increasingly devastating risks and costs of losing nature. Pavan has brought to us the credibility, the language, the expertise, and connecting with the right kinds of people to move all of this forward. Pavan was among one of the first to be taken seriously as he articulated his ideas about shareholder capitalism versus stakeholder capitalism. And the reason Pavan was taken seriously is because he was a banker making these radical statements and not a tree hugger. I was impassioned by the idea that people ignore externalities. If you look at the private sector overall, these externalities are over 12 to 15 trillion dollars. That is too big to ignore. So I decided to start a project called the Green Accounting for Indian States Project. And um, this was my hobby. Other bankers went on Saturdays and did 12 rounds of golf. I went to my books and I did this instead. The TEEP study has made this really big effort to include the services we receive from nature as a part of economic accounting. And this has led to the creation of the Natural Capital Coalition, which is another instrument to remind us that we cannot take the gifts of nature for granted. T was a way of almost, um, maybe a way of describing the effect that you have when you put on your glasses for the first time and you start seeing things clearly that beforehand were not clear. Today the idea that we can run business as if it's okay to make private profits while you inflict public losses, that idea has to go. Every woman, man and child has to understand that this is not okay. We'd see a world where tracking nature was just as important as tracking our own economic activity. Winning the Tyler Prize is just amazing. Um, it, it's, it's something that all of us have understood is a huge recognition of, of good work. And uh, I, I just feel humble that I rank with people like Gretchen Daly, who's winning it with me today. So it's fantastic. 
To formally present the first award, I warmly welcome one of my great colleagues on the Tyler Prize Executive Committee, Margaret Catley Carlson. Maggie works tirelessly on several boards and councils to improve water resource management, including in the UN Secretary General's Advisory Board on Water. Thank you for joining me, Maggie. Thank you, Julia. Pavan Suktiv, a true sustainability thought leader, has developed and animated increasingly widely accepted tools to make economics and finance the foundation pillar of conservation. Threats to our ecosystem and biodiversity increase daily. Environmentalists, scholars, global institutions document the planetary change. Governments monitor and set directions for change. But corporations, manufacturers and producers are the great change creators. How to manage this? It's true that what cannot be measured cannot be managed. It's not likely. Pavan Sukhdev sees economics as the currency of policy change, corporations as the essential change agents. And he has worked out the metrics which assign value in both environmental and economic terms. In recognition for extraordinary improvements in our understanding and application of the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity and bringing together the worlds of finance and economics together with those of conservation, we present you the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement. Thank you, Maggie. It's a real honour and a great pleasure to accept the Tyler Prize this year, especially alongside my friend Gretchen Daly, whose work has always inspired me. My gratitude, firstly, to John and Alice Tyler, who, so long before it was accepted wisdom, saw the importance of fresh research on environmental sustainability and of urgent societal responses to that research. My thanks to the dynamic Julia Martin Lefebvre and her Tyler Price Committee for recognizing the importance of mainstreaming the economics of nature and to the dedicated work of the executive team to organize this ceremony despite the strains and disruptions caused by COVID-19. Indeed, they've turned a challenge into an opportunity to bring the issues that we work on to the attention of an engaged and indeed global audience. Pavan, thank you. So now to present our next award, I'm pleased to introduce another of my colleagues from the Tyler Prize Executive Committee, Ezequiel Escura. Ezequiel has contributed an enormous amount of research to plant ecology and conservation, authored hundreds of articles, and is currently a professor of ecology at the University of California. Thank you, Julia. Gretchen Daly has revolutionized the way we think about conservation biology in the Anthropocene and how we understand our global environment giving birth to a new discipline on biodiversity in human modified landscapes. Her writings and ideas on ecosystem services have served as a foundation for understanding how nature provides the goods and services that supports human societies and has also revolutionized environmental finance, establishing new ways to align financial incentives with conservation. The view of ecosystems as capital assets has become one of the most important new ideas in contemporary ecology. Her research has transformed the practice of conservation biology and has mainstreamed the concept of ecosystem value for society and decision makers. In recognition of pioneering scientific research in ecology and conservation to understand the essential services ecosystems provide and in enabling meaningful valuation of natural capital in decision making, we present you the Tyler Price for Environmental Achievement. Thank you. Distinguished guests and friends, thank you so much for sharing this moment to reflect on the challenging times we're all living and on the ways of driving societal transformation that we all need to secure our future. I want to express my deep appreciation to many people for their heroic efforts in this cause, 
first off to John and Alice Tyler, who established the prize to recognize science and public leadership in securing and regenerating the life support systems of our beautiful planet. I wanna thank the incomparable Julia Martin Lefebvre for her, her incredible inspiration and impact. She's chair of the Tyler Prize. I wanna thank the executive committee and superb team that's making possible our celebration and conversation here. And also who's communicating much more widely the crisis and the critical opportunity and heroic impacts we've already made. Finally, I wanna thank the many recipients of the Tyler Prize, heroes who stand out as mentors to me, most especially Partha Dasgupta, Paul and Ann Ehrlich, Madaf Godgill, John Holdren, Simon Levin, Tom Lovejoy, Jane Ludchenko, Hal Mooney, and Jose Sarukang. I've got really good embarrassing stories about all of them, except Madaf, I realize now, and I'll need to get together with him and, and remedy that problem. I also want to thank especially Pete and Helen Bing and Vicki and Roger Sant, who've played an enormous role in my life in different ways and in supporting the Natural Capital Project from the beginning. But the greatest credit in the prize really shines on the many more people, the thousands and now millions of people engaging in the drive to solutions and in making these solutions ever more accessible, ever more adaptable and scalable. So together we're mainstreaming the values of nature into mindsets and into decision making. I'm most grateful in this arena <clears throat> to share the award with my hero, Pavan Sukhdev, who operates in the private sector in realms where few scientists have tread in the past and yet where we must join hands and focus now for transformation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gretchen. And please don't go anywhere because we have a very important discussion with you coming up after the break. But to our viewers at home, we've had some incredible comments and questions already coming in on our social media. So if you'd like to be part of the conversation, please add your comments here on YouTube or on Twitter by tagging at Tyler Price. And stay with us because after the break, we'll be having a discussion on valuing nature and unwinding economics most dismal failure. Welcome back to the Tyler Price discussion on valuing nature and unwinding economics most dismal failure. We're first going to hear some comments from our two laureates on their roles in valuing nature, and then we'll be opening up to a Q&A discussion. So if you haven't already, please add your comments and questions for our laureates here on YouTube in the comments section or by tagging us on Twitter at Tyler Price. We'll start off with Professor Gretchen Daly, who will explain to us the term ecosystem services, a term that she herself coined, and hopefully explain a little bit about her organization, the Natural Capital Project, and the work that they're doing around the world to help include valuing nature in our decision-making. Over to you, Gretchen. Thank you so much. We're all here together to talk about the revolution that we've been dreaming of driving, working to drive across our lives, and I'm happy to report basically tremendous progress, even in the face of the terrible times we're living, thinking about the pandemic, the climate extremes, the tremendous social challenges, and other problems that beset us here in the United States and globally. But at the same time, there's an emerging transformation, one that brings me and many others great hope that we will bring our better selves to the cause to arrest the problems in time and to achieve the outcomes that we all hope for people and the planet. So the core of this is to recognize first off that people are an intimate part of nature. From when we wake up in the early morning hearing the bird song 
drinking coffee and recognizing that it was little wild bees from the rainforest that came out and pollinated that coffee and made its quality and abundance possible, to turning on the tap and recognizing how much it's forests and wetlands that made the flow of that pure and safe drinking water possible. In all of these ways, we're deeply connected to nature. And more and more, we're seeing these connections reflected in policies, in finance, in actual day-to-day decision-making. And one of the ways in which this is most powerfully being driven is through three basic steps. The first is demonstrations, bringing leaders together from communities all over the world in many different sectors, whether it's in agriculture and rural landscapes on which all of our lives depend intimately, or in the heart of cities where people are planning where the next development's gonna go. And these innovative partnerships between researchers and those trying to embed the values of nature into decisions are yielding second, a very systematic way of going about this that's now embedded in software. It sounds like maybe just a Silicon Valley approach putting into software and data what we need. And yet this is a way of becoming ever more systematic about it and bringing in, in an open source way, contributions from thousands of scientists. We're now seeing more and more through this software we can identify where and how to transform and how to align livelihoods with this integration of nature's values into all that we do. Um, We're now in the third step beginning to see standards emerge from first the demonstrations, second to embedding all of this into software, enabling others to adapt and adopt the approaches, and now third, given that we all live in an ever more interconnected way across the planet with so much of what we do completely dependent on what others in other parts of the world are doing, we need standards, we need sort of table manners around the great buffet that is nature feeding us. And we need an agreement on how we're going to sit politely at at the table and share and protect and restore all that nature has given us. So these standards are reflected um, in one of the most exciting recent changes was by the United Nations Statistical Commission in March of 2021 blessing a new metric that has been co-developed, led by China, but ready for implementation across the world. It's called Gross Ecosystem Product, and it's um, alongside Gross Domestic Product, a way of accounting for all of the benefits that come from nature, who receives those benefits, and how to ensure their continued supply. So this is now being scaled along with many other dimensions of that three-step pathway from demonstrations to software and tools, making them accessible and actionable globally through to standards. This is all being scaled thanks to the major development banks. These are entities like the Inter-American Development Bank serving Latin America and the Caribbean the Asian Development Bank serving countries across Asia, and the World Bank serving countries globally, all are aiming to mainstream the values of nature into all of their activities. And together they account for investments of about $100 billion per year through different loans and other mechanisms around the world. They're meant to drive human development and basically drive a change in how we think about development and what human development really needs to be in the century ahead. So with all of this, we're now at the cusp where Pavan really needs to pick up and is picking up in a tremendous way of bringing the private sector into this. We have a lot of public facing governments, uh, central banks, development banks, and many other um, institutions society-wide 
coming together around these standards and this way of approaching our problems. But we need much more private sector involvement and I'm thrilled to turn over to Pavan in helping to explain where things stand, illuminate the hope for us and a clear path forward. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. And indeed, that's what I like to talk about. How the private sector can recognize the value of nature unwinding economics' most dismal failure. This is about valuation. Valuation is a human institution and a habit of human nature. As Professor David Pierce used to say, it can be explicit or implicit, but it cannot fail to happen at all. As humans, we recognize nature's values intuitively as individuals and communities, and we've done so for centuries. When Yellowstone was declared a national park in 1872, there was no economic valuation that was needed. President Grant just decreed it so as American heritage in the interest of posterity. Then secondly, we often demonstrate these values in economic terms in the accounts of society, for example, as natural capital adjustments using the recently announced United Nations system of environmental and economic accounts. Or we can express them in the impacts of business through environmental profit and loss accounts as Puma did, or as integrated profit and loss accounts as was done by Sviaskog, that's Sweden's largest forestry company, or Yarra Valley Water, Melbourne's water utility. We can also demonstrate this in policy decisions, as Kampala City did, by leaving its Nakivubo swamp undammed, because these wetlands had demonstrably larger economic value as a natural sewage treatment plant for the city than by damming them up. Sometimes, finally, we can also capture these values of nature through policies and mechanisms and markets. National policies such as Costa Rica's payments for ecosystem services to cattle ranchers based on the acreage that they conserve, or local policies such as New York's agreement with farmers in the Catskills to keep their aquifers unpolluted in order to provide water for city residents. And finally, in business decisions such as reforestation funded by the shipping industry alongside the Panama Canal to prevent excessive siltation of the canal in other words, to avoid higher insurance premiums. We need to recognize that environmental impacts arise from human economic activity through various major drivers. Greenhouse gas emissions of business, waste generated, pollution and our use of land and the oceans. And in today's largely free market economy, with two thirds of the economy being private sector in terms of uh, gross value added or jobs, the drivers of most of these environmental impacts are actually the private sector. I believe that economics' most dismal failure is that it fails to recognize or to measure or to value or to provide any mechanisms to manage private sector externalities. What are these externalities? They are basically impacts. They are third party costs of doing business, which are simply not accounted for by the parties conducting their business. For example, an automaker makes profits by making and selling cars and its customers enjoy the utility of the car that they've purchased. Both are happy. However, neither of them have accounted for the air pollution from the car, which has caused respiratory diseases to some pedestrians, or the greenhouse gas emissions of the car, which has contributed to climate change costs, such as the destruction caused by increased storms and cyclones and sea level rise. These externalities of the private sector have grown by leaps and bounds, and they are now estimated to cost society over $11 trillion annually. That's about 15% of the global gross domestic project. These externalities are therefore undoubtedly the biggest free lunch in the history of the universe. But can any free lunch last forever? Is it actually possible to escape internalization of externalities? I don't think so. Today's externalities are tomorrow's risks and the day after tomorrow's losses. And the community that understands this reality, perhaps the sharpest and the best and the most painfully, is the investor community. They fear the internalization of externalities. They know that the negative externalities of the corporate sector are the hidden negative alpha of major investment portfolios. Asset owners, be they family offices or insurers or pension funds or indeed sovereign wealth funds, do know that the interest of stakeholders has to be considered alongside the interest of shareholders, not just because that's the right ethical choice, but because it's the right risk management choice as well. Asset managers, be they large or small, are under increasing pressure from asset owners to recognize, measure, and manage their portfolio's impacts on society 
not only their portfolio's returns on capital invested. Asset managers may also decide to use one of several hundred ESG rating methodologies that have been evolved so far. But as the Harvard Business School has recently pointed out, ESG ratings don't measure impacts. Only impact valuation does, and it is a relatively new science. So the question that springs to mind is, how prepared is the investor community today across asset managers and, and uh, portfolio managers and asset owners to use impact valuation as their new sustainability yardstick? I believe they're ready. I see today a veritable tsunami of interest from asset managers to quantify and track and measure and value the impact of their portfolios on societies. In other words, their portfolios externalities. In doing so, I believe these investors are moving to a new world and indeed to a new modern portfolio theory in which they not only measure risk and return, but also the quality in terms of sustainability of their portfolios. And in doing so, they are sparking the next big transformation. That's society's transition from the old unsustainable world of shareholder capitalism to the brave new world of stakeholder capitalism. Truly, therefore, the key to unwinding economics' most dismal failure is to reprogram economics to be able to recognize, measure, value, and manage private sector externalities. Wow, Pavan, thank you so much for that great rethink of our economic system. And I hope that there's a lot of investors out there taking notes. We're now going to start with our Q&A discussion. So if you haven't already contributed your questions, please do so here on YouTube in the comments section or by tagging us on Twitter at Tyler Price. Now, if our laureates don't get to answer your questions during this discussion today, don't worry, they'll be answering throughout the week on our social media. So please make sure you're following us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so that you don't miss out on those answers. So to kick off our q and I'll hand over to Julia Maton Leferva, Chair of the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement, to ask the first question. Are you there, Julia? Yes, I'm here, Jade. So the first question is a great one. It simply asks, it seems to me that what you're suggesting is so obvious. So what are the obstacles? Why doesn't everyone agree with what you're saying? Yeah, Julia, you're right. It is obvious. But let me try and address your question, which is uh, actually the answer differs depending on whether you're an investor or a corporation or a policymaker. I think investors get it and they want to move in this direction. Their problem is just lack of information and data. In the case of the corporations, I'm sorry to say, it's, it's a free lunch, right? Why wouldn't you keep enjoying a free lunch unless it stops? So we need to think of the policy levers, the incentives, the disincentives, and finally public pressure from everyone in order to make change of behavior happen, in order to make sure that externalities are recognized in the way that business plans are drawn up, business investments made. So there's work to do out there. And finally, policy makers. I mean, honestly, I am a little disappointed. It's not surprising that policymakers are weak-willed uh, and they lack the guts and gumption to do the right thing. It is a bit disappointing though. A final key point here is there's a lot of skepticism when the wealthy countries in the world are not doing this themselves and instead are maintaining so many aspects of their economic and other um, kind of levels of well-being at the expense of others. It sometimes feels like corporations only take action when enough scrutiny is placed on them. And even then, they tend to only do the minimum. So do you think it's really possible for us to switch from a model of shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism? The way corporations are structured today makes me fear that they'll never really change, that they'll always be focused on profits first. If corporations don't change, we're all in for one hell of a time. So Pavan, help us out here. I, I completely agree with Kretchen. I mean, yes, we have to change. There is not a choice. We cannot continue on the current trajectory towards all of the planetary boundaries, hitting one after the other in disastrous succession. That can't be the way forward for humanity or indeed for other life on this planet. We need to recognize the reality that we have willy-nilly adopted an economic system which has defects. It doesn't measure or value externalities and we need to fix those defects. So I think the time for action is now. Here's an interesting one. So some in the conservation space have said your approach is commodifying nature. How would you respond? Now, I think there is a misunderstanding here, which I'd, which I'd like to clarify. We are not commodifying nature. The difference between what we are recommending, which is valuation 
and pricing and marketization and modification, there's a huge difference, right? Value, valuation is about valuing what you receive. Price is what you pay. You know, when it comes to nature, she provides most of her gifts to us for free. So we are receiving these gifts for free and because we don't value them, we end up destroying them. And that doesn't help anybody or anything. The real problem that we face today is that nature is not accounted for anywhere in decision making. It's basically a zero. And saying that nature is infinitely valuable, however much and however many of us might hold that view, that's not a pragmatic way to help in decision making. Nature is being destroyed at an ever more rapid rate and we need to come together in an agreed way to bring at least the lower bound values of nature in decision making for things that we all hold dear, which include clean water, protection from flooding, a stable climate, and a bright future for our children. And remember, you know, the challenge of working in an existing system without valuation and without an appropriate recognition and demonstration and capture of these values of nature has been the destruction that you've seen for decades on end. We've tried everything else. We've tried appeals to the heart. Uh, we've tried arguing with policymakers. But what perhaps needs to be tried is using the toolkit of valuation. Well, this next question is actually a comment from one of your fellow Tyler Prize laureates, Dr. Paul Ehrlich, who said, we don't need to know a single additional thing on the scientific front to know what direction we ought to be heading. So my question is, do you think that we should be redirecting our resources away from more research and towards more action? Well, Paul is right. There is enough information, there is enough research, there's enough knowledge. What there isn't is action, and the reasons for that are many. Some are to do with the lack of will, a lack of public understanding of the issues, and some are to do with the mechanics of measuring and valuing externalities. And I would say Gretchen and I think that if we can move in this direction, which is about engaging the private sector from the investor side and then also engaging the private sector from the corporate side, the buy side and the sell side together. These engagements can actually change the tenor of the conversation. I couldn't agree more. This is a time to move way beyond more research and into ever more impactful ways of engaging in how we develop the research, engaging with the people who would actually use it so that it's designed in a way to be maximally effective and impactful. And I couldn't agree more that the action, the real action ahead, is mostly on the social side. Speaking of action and making change, here's a question for Pavan. So Pavan, do you know if economic students today are still being taught to use externalities to write off the damage that corporations are doing? Well, I, I think you know, externalities typically come up in chapter 11 of a 12 chapter economics textbook. So the level of importance that the subject deserves, it does not get, right? So uh, the teaching of externalities and how to measure them, how to value them, how to manage them, and what it means for policymakers and administrators and businesses, and indeed the common people. You know, this should be part of every economics course. Unfortunately, it is not. And I think that's a huge failing of the um, educational institutions of our time. They, they should correct this failing yesterday. So here's a question from one of our former Tyler Prize laureates, Jane Goodall, who I think everybody on the planet knows. How do we address the, the um, disparity between the rich and the poor? How do, how, do we, how do we make an even playing field so that we actually can move towards a more sustainable future. You know, I'm fond of saying that to make poverty history, you need to make nature the future. But let me explain a couple of examples of what I mean by that. Firstly, when we look at the dependency of poor, stressed communities living in infertile lands, and we see how much they depend on nature, we need to recognize that nature is actually a very large part of the GDP of the poor, as I call it. So if we want to support them, if we want to improve their agricultural practices, if we want to improve their livelihoods and reduce their dependency on local forests for fuel wood and reduce their dependency on local nature for, for their survival, we need to help them be more productive in a sustainable way, which means sustainable agriculture. Out of the billion odd people who are smallholder farmers, 
the majority are actually in smallholder situations where they have small lots and we need to make those small lot holders able to have higher resilience against the vicissitudes of climate change. We need to give them the support they need to make their models sustainable and we need to give them fair pricing. So these are the things that we need to do for the poor to bring them up the curve of wealth and to enable them to enjoy and benefit from what society can offer. We have another question from one of your fellow Tyler Price laureates, Dr. Michael Mann, and he asks a really tricky one, which is, it's easy for us to all be having these philosophical discussions, but what hard policy changes do we need to make right now in order to make a tangible difference? That's a great question, Dr. Mann, because hard policy changes are exactly what we need. Firstly, by recognizing and communicating through public interest advertising, the risks of pursuing today's economic direction to oblivion, right? Now COVID sadly, tragically, gives us an opportunity to talk about the reality that the genesis of this is our inability to live in harmony with nature. We enable, due to the destruction of nature, due to the ingress of natural systems into human systems, we enabled a virus to propagate that has destroyed almost two million lives. So we should talk about that. We should talk about the fact that storms and cyclones, floods and droughts are destroying at an ever increasing rate farm productivity and properties along coastlines. This should be communicated. This messaging needs to take place through public interest advertising funded by governments. I think that's policy, <laughs> policy change number one. I think in driving these approaches forward on the scale required and at the pace required, the biggest challenge really will be in trust. What would help um, drive things successfully, creating that trust, I think is to have very successful demonstrations that engage as key partners, players that could also engage much more widely. Today, we are far too focused on trying to tax the goods, if you like, profits, ingenuity profits, corporation tax, right? hard work, salaries, income tax. We are far too focused on taxing the goods and not enough on taxing the bads. So why can't we recognize that as the economy becomes more challenged, but you can see what's going on, the pie is shrinking for us to be able to increase corporation tax, politically unacceptable, or increase income tax, right? So we need to look at other ways of adding fiscal balance. And those other ways are effectively resource taxation. When we do that, when we start taxing the bads and not taxing the goods, we will actually be addressing the problem of externalities by pushing economics in the direction of reducing those externalities, reducing those third party costs. That's given us some heavy information to think about, but I want to switch now to some positive news. So can you give us some examples of the most tangible, positive success stories that you've seen and what you think it might take to scale up these success stories. The one that stands out for me is just in zoning land. This sounds so obvious and we're used to zoning land for lots of different reasons. Today, many countries are picking up on land zoning for nature, for human well-being. And we're seeing this being done to secure drinking water supplies for major cities. Over 50 cities in Latin America have now zoned land in the upper reaches of their watersheds to maintain a steady, reliable flow of clean and healthy drinking water. We're also seeing it on coastlines where people, all the communities living on coastlines are zoning land for protection from floods and sea level rise and storm surges. And in both of those examples, people are being paid. They're real finance mechanisms enabling this zoning and in aligning livelihoods of people who live in those places with the production of these benefits that everybody's counting on. Absolutely, I think payments for ecosystem services of the, the kind that you describe, zoning as, as a device, as, as a mechanism, these are all great initiatives. But I think the other side of the coin needs to be addressed, which is today we have so much money being invested in and spent on environmentally and socially destructive policies and, and initiatives. Why do we have $300 billion of subsidies basically for farming, which causes the health problems of today? 
Why do we have $35 billion of subsidies for unsustainable fishing? I think we need to start declaring what these subsidies are, which are actually pushing the economy in the wrong direction, disclosing them and talking about them, making them the topic of public interest that they need to be, because this is destroying our future generations. So do you have some final words for those individuals at home who are watching us who might want to help find those solutions? As an individual, it's really hard to know what to do sometimes. I would say, number one, there's a role for everyone. And number two, bringing your energy and heart to this cause can only do good. If you look at greenhouse gas emissions, people think farms contribute 23%, but if you look at food systems all the way from the forests that are destroyed to create the space to grow the corn or the soya to feed the beef, more forest clearance to feed the people. If you account for all of that and the waste and the emissions of transportation across continents, that's almost half the greenhouse gas emissions of this planet. What can we do to tackle food systems? What can you do to tackle food systems? Buy smart. Buy food which has low footprint. Buy local. Buy food which does not have huge pesticide and fertilizer input because that's one of the ways in which you can improve your own health. The Global Nutrition Report in 2016 said that our diets had become the number one burden of disease. That's saying something. That's what we eat is causing our ill health more than anything else in the world and the costs of that ill health. So I think what we eat, how we eat, where we buy from, buy local, buy organic if it's available, buy natural if that's available, and steer the demand pressures on this economic system called food systems. I think that's something that all of us can do as individuals, contribute in the right direction for society and for the poor farmers as well. There's always a worry that there'll be winners and losers. And the challenge for us is to find some way of forging a win-win path. Well, thank you for what's been a very vigorous discussion, but that's all we have time for for today. Thank you so much to our two laureates, Gretchen and Pavan. I know that there was a few questions in the comments section that weren't quite answered today, but our laureates will be answering them after the show and we'll be releasing those answers on our Tyler Prize Instagram, Facebook and on Twitter throughout the week. So don't forget to follow us on those social media platforms. But for now, I'll hand back over to you, Julia. So now the call for nominations for the 2022 Tyler Prize is open and on our website. The Tyler Prize Executive Committee welcomes nominations from all parts of the world. A huge thank you to our promotional partners, all of whom are working towards our common goal of valuing natural capital. We invite you to share this conversation with any who you think might be interested and also check out our educational resources on our website, tylerprize.org. Thank you so much for joining us today. Bye for now.